Thank you, Heidi. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sam Kokoza. I'm a trainer for the French Equestrian Federation, now based in the UK. And my field of expertise is really what's going on inside the horse's body, how they move, why they move the way they do, and all the little things that can go wrong um, in the process. Um, I wrote a book called Core Conditioning for Horses, which is a sort of general uh, way of conditioning the core muscles of your horse so they are more comfortable being ridden and can perform better and healthier for longer. And so I suppose that segues very cleanly to where we are today, which is uh, dealing with uh, horses that have a compromised uh, spinal column, their posture isn't very good, and what we can do about it. And obviously, you have a lot of questions, so do I. And hopefully together we can find some answers. So um, what have we got on the list, ladies? Excellent. Well, we've got quite a few questions to start with around symptoms. So I guess this is the beginning of the journey, recognising when your horse has potentially has kissing spine. So it might be worth you sort of outlining some of your experiences of, of symptoms and what your thoughts are. And then we'll go specifically into we've got questions from Linda, Sally and Catherine that we could add. Great stuff. Yeah, sure. Well, there are lots of symptoms. And unfortunately, with uh, horse behaviour, symptoms of, of pain or discomfort often look like other things. Uh, they often look like they may be behavioural. They can look like unsoundness or unlevelness and even lameness sometimes. Uh, sensitivity, um, aggression. Um, they come in really ev as every horse is different because in the same way that all people are different. Um, what the, the combination of symptoms that the horse displays are, are, are unique really to each one. Um, in particular though, I think there are some sort of giveaway signals that the horse displays in the beginning of this long process of the sort of degeneration of the posture and the core muscles. Um, One-sidedness is particularly common, so if the horse will turn easily to the right, but very stiff to the left. It's a, quite an obvious one and a very common one. Um, sensitivity when you put the saddle on the back, biting you when you do up the girth. And that's not, these aren't, again, these, these aren't necessarily all indicators of kissing spine. It's more when they're in groups, uh, because of course some horses are just a bit bitey when you do up the girth. And that doesn't necessarily mean it has a kissing spine. But uh, that is something that horses do when they uh, anticipate the pain of what is to come. Um, also, I find that um, when you are picking out your horse's hind feet, if they'll lift one up, and, but the other one, they want to kick it away and get it out of your hand to put it down again, or it doesn't lift quite as high as the other one. This is because there's a... But... Uh, Amongst all the obvious symptoms, it's very important to remember that uh, because the uh, impingement of the processes um, can pinch a nerve, in which case you get an explosive reaction from the horse, but also it can miss the nerve completely. So it's just sort of bone on bone. Um, I read that around 40% of horses are asymptomatic. So they won't necessarily show any of the classical symptoms of discomfort. Nevertheless, if the spine is compromised, just as it is with our own, you will see a horse that is underperforming. They will be reluctant, even if they're not biting you when you girth up, or even if they can lift up their hind limbs, even if they're quite even on each rein. Um, we find that the, um, the energy flow from the back of the horse to the front of the horse is interrupted by tension, and, and the reason uh, the horse is tense in the back when they have a compromised uh, spinal column is because the muscles around the area just lock up to stop the bones from rubbing against each other. It's bad enough when they touch, but if they rub, that is really uncomfortable. So the muscles tense up. And so we find that your, your horse has a, let's say a high head carriage and won't round or muscle wastage along the top line, particularly at the base of the neck. So if you see a prominent wither, again, that's uh, a prominent wither in, in some horses like thoroughbreds isn't necessarily an indication of a lack of muscle. It's the build. But if you see a horse who's generally strong in the low line around the shoulders and the bum and the top line, 
around the, uh, the base of the neck, the wither, and where the saddle goes. If there's any sort of hollows there, then that's an indication that uh, the horse isn't using those muscles because it, he can't. Uh, yeah, so if the musculature is locked to protect itself, then you will get a, a wastage of muscle mass along the top line. Fantastic. Thank you, Sam. Just to link into the specific questions, I think you've covered some of these, these aspects. Um, Catherine asked, if a horse, horse goes very much quarters in um, in one way and in canter, would that be typical of a young horse or indicative of kissing spine? Good question. And again, um, most horses are naturally crooked. I think because they're, like us, left or right-handed, so they tend to lead in a particular direction. And when you watch when you watch a dog canter, they canter crooked. They haven't got a kissing spine. So I think there's a there's a point where lack of training, where the horse is just naturally favoring one side and therefore the quarters swing in because that's the looser side. Um, if that isn't trainable away, if the musculature is blocking you from straightening your horse without a lot of force from the saddle, then um, that is probably an indication that, that the horse is in some discomfort. But again, if when the horse locks up through the back to protect, uh, to protect the, 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 the bones from rubbing against each other, they often lock up more on their more dominant side. So if they're a right-handed horse, the muscle that you sit on, the longissimus dorsi, the, 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 there are two of them and they run either side of the spine. Because one always locks up a little bit more than the other one, this makes the movement asymmetrical. And it, there's very little you can do about it from the saddle because of course the, the horse weighs 10 times the rider. And if they're swinging sideways, they're swinging sideways. So if you find that you can't correct it with normal training, it's probably an indicator. Great, thank you. And another one to link into the symptoms aspect as well. Um, from Linda, do symptoms vary day to day? My, may, my mare can be fine, but sometimes she will we'll shake her head uh, down in the first few minutes of trot and then seem to settle. Other days we have absolutely no head shake. Well, head shaking is an interesting one because again, it can be an indication of discomfort, but it also could be all sorts of other things. Um, if this horse has been diagnosed and you have a set of x-rays, um, then yes, of course, like us, when something isn't right in the body, we have better days and less good days. It very much depends on, you know, how they slept, what they did yesterday. You know, if there's a certain amount of muscle fatigue uh, from the work, which of course will be accentuated by the fact that certain muscles are under tension and other ones are very, very weak. So if you went on a long hack and the next day the horse seems worse, that is a bit of an indicator, yeah. Um, particularly if it's associated with more one-sidedness than you saw the previous day. Yeah, again, you're looking for patterns, aren't you? Um, patterns, groups, yeah. yeah. These things come in groups. Yeah. And we have a question from, from Sally. Do horses show, again, symptomatic, um, do horses show signs of aggression towards other horses and anxiety in the stable, as well as anxiety for traveling as a result of kissing spine, as well as the other symptoms you mentioned? Yes, now this is, this is a very, very interesting point. Um, when a horse experiences chronic discomfort, it has an effect on the blood chemistry. So the adrenal levels rise, cortisol levels rise. Now, this happens in all creatures, but in the horse, because it's a prey animal, it adds a complication because of course, if they feel physically compromised and they have these instincts that they're constantly looking out for wolves and velociraptors hiding in the hedge, I mean, they all see them, but if, if a horse has elevated uh, adrenal levels, they will display accentuated um, reactions to these things. So yes, they'll be more grumpy. <coughs> they will see things that aren't there because they feel that, I think that they feel that they can't get away as, as, as quickly as they would be able to if they were in good health. Mm -hmm. So they see, they try, they, I think they feel 
that they have to see the predator coming from further away. And as a result, they see them everywhere. Now, back to the question with aggression, I think, again, raised adrenal levels, if the horse has a tendency to be dominant, yes, I think they can become quite aggressive to other horses. And I'd say this is normal. And, you know, I, I think, I, I hope you haven't, but I've certainly experienced people in chronic pain and they're very grumpy too. Mm. Um, and who can blame them? So yes, that, that is another one of those symptomatic um, aspects. But again, not to be taken as an individual, yeah. but seen as a, a, as a whole. Yeah. But when it comes to symptoms, the only real way to determine what's going on in the horse, particularly with the spine, is to have a full spinal x-ray. Mm -hmm. Then you know, this is a mechanical system. Yes, of course, you've got the soft tissue and the neurological aspect to it. But because uh, this is bone on bone, we can see it very easily with a good set of x-rays and then we know where it is and we then can come up with a plan of how to deal with it. Um, so the, the, the observation of symptoms are only a complement to good diagnostics with your vet. Yeah, yeah, okay. So if we move on to a section now where uh, symptoms have been recognized, um, a pattern is formed, you've had the professionals in, you've, you've, you've had an x-ray and, and you can see there's some spinal processes that are, are too close um, and there's a diagnosis. But now, if you wouldn't mind sort of giving us, and then we'll go on to um, some questions, um, an idea of the length of time for rehab. So, so how long does it take? Where do you start, I guess? Mm -hmm. Well, after obviously working with your vet is the first port of call, not just for the diagnostics, but also for um, treatment. Because I believe that if the horse is experiencing discomfort, the kindest thing we can do is give them some alleviation for that discomfort. Particularly if we're going to undertake a rehabilitation. And you know, anyone that has seen on the TV, I hope nobody's experienced it, somebody going through a re rehabilitation after a nasty accident, it is painful, <laughs> but it's worth it because without it, the quality of life really isn't up to the mark. And because one can undergo a full rehabilitation with many things, um, because it, it's a short-term sacrifice for long-term comfort and quality of life, it's definitely worth it. So I uh, find that the, I work with the vet usually to medicate the areas and the potential areas so not just places where it's obviously touching, but ones that might touch in motion with the weight of the rider on top um, is the best place to start. So that's a good place to start for helping the horse take on what, what we're going to ask them to do. Now, how long it takes really depends on the case. They really are all different. Some are very stoic. Some have a high pain threshold. Some have a, a, a great deal of uh, muscular tension. Some have a little. So I think it really depends on many variables. But we tend to look at it from the perspective of three months to get over the initial hump of muscles in spasm and bones touching. Within three months of really intensive work, we can separate the processes sufficiently and release the top line musculature, which is the first place to start, to release the system, to, 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 to rid the system of any compressions. Um, after that three months, once the horse can work very, very long and low and is completely released through the musculature, um, we have to go through, a I find we have to go through a phase of about a month of coordination work because if the horse has had a kissing spine issue developing, it's usually been developing over years. So it's only become noticeable after it's come to a point where the horse is finding it difficult to tolerate it. Mm. Yeah, and you're getting uh, problems with the riding, jumpers are stopping, horses may say rear or, or not want to accept the contact, it'd be very difficult to turn. Um, so after we've released the system, um, we have to teach the horse how to use the body. Again, 
all in a very, very low impulsion environment. So it's more about developing the, uh, the control of the limbs and re but nevertheless retaining suppleness. Because of course, a horse that's had a spasm will not know how to use their limbs properly. <clears throat> they'll, be, they'll have been paddling with the front end, pushing with the back end and using their limbs, shoulders and hips to, to do the job that the spine should be doing, which is bending, flexing and absorbing energy. That usually takes about a month. And, and that we do with static exercises like turn about the forehand and uh, uh, leg yield is very good also to get these areas moving and to teach the horse where their legs are and how far they can stretch them now while using their back because of course they never have generally. Um, so that's usually around a month. And then I think really two months minimum to retrain the core muscles and build them so that they can, the horse can sustain this new way of going with the rider on board. So end to end, really six to 12 months. It sounds like a long time. And when I tell horse owners that it's gonna take six months, really minimum to sort this problem out, they, they tend to look like this is a bit of a shock. I think they want a quicker fix. And of course, who doesn't? But if, we take on board that you're taking uh, an animal that doesn't understand what's going on, so you can't really help. Um, decompress his entire body, relearn how to move, and then gain strength from the inside of his body out. Well, that's just how long it takes. You know, um, releasing a system which is compromised takes time and it's hard and the horse has to invest themselves and that takes time for them to try again to start to try to use the parts of their body that they're not used to using because of course they're very defensive about it who can blame them um, the coordination aspect is generally i find the easiest because of course we're now dealing with a very loose horse so we've just got to ask them to swing place their limbs and get used to it the core strengthening, the, the, the toning aspect where we build the muscle. This is, uh, this is a difficult one because you have to change your approach. You have to feed and you have to work because you're building muscle. And as we all know, building muscle takes time. You have to break a fiber, it has to split into two. The horse has to have a good health to rebuild uh, all the muscle tissue, particularly if you're, you're missing a 15 kilo muscle and that has to rebuild you know it's a lot of work so that's why it takes the time that it takes yeah. and and of course there may be some other things going on as well and one of our attendees has just made a made a comment um which i missed just before which is when we were talking about symptoms they said a lot of those symptoms are not necessarily spinal. They could be oh. other musculoskeletal issues or there could be ulcers. And there, there may be other things to resolve along, along the way, mightn't there? Yeah, it's true. Um, unfortunately, with a biological system is that once one thing gets out of whack, mm. something else gets out of whack and you can end up with groups. For example, when it comes to um, the horse's posture and its spinal alignment, once we solve one major problem, often we find another one in a different place, which is a result of the first one. So we have to go through it like layers of an onion. And um, yes, of course, if you've got a horse that can't use his back properly and he's been working like that for about five years, um, he's not going to be straight. He's going to be crooked. So this means that there's been an excess load on one forelimb in particular, and probably one hind limb. Also, you get rotations in the limb, which it's not designed to do. So you get tears, you get uh, inflammation, you get all sorts of soft tissue damage. Uh, so yes, you have to go through them one by one and solve them. But on the positive side, if you can get to the origin point of the misalignment and solve it, Generally, those secondary and tertiary problems that we encounter, well, you've removed the cause. So if you have a, 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 a chronic hock issue, for example, in a youngish horse, 
And you, uh, we, we see from behind that because the pelvis isn't moving properly, because the back isn't moving properly, there's a twist to the hind limb. It's very common. If you look at horses walking from behind, you see most of them, as they push off, tend to twist. Well, the, the, this limb is not designed to twist. So you can treat the hot problem, but if you don't cause, uh, treat the cause of the hot problem, then of course, you're constantly treating a symptom. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you have to be a detective as well. Yeah. yeah. And like you said, it's working with your vet to understand you know, what's, what's what all of the things that are going on, not just the one, yeah. Um, question linking into to vets, x-rays, etc. Can you actually improve the kissing spine x-rays with correct training and core work? Is that something you... Yes, of course. <laughs> you see, the, 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 the reason kissing spine occurs is because the, um, the thoracic section, the rib cage, the bit that we sit on, isn't designed to flex downwards. It's only designed to flex laterally, so mm. side to side, like a fish. Um, so even though the spine has dipped slightly, by targeting and isolating that area and the musculature that controls it, yes, you can lift the spine, spread the processes and reverse it. But if you're not isolating it properly, the horse will use absolutely the rest of its body, absolutely every part of its body to avoid using it, which is why it's tricky. Yeah. But yes, completely reversible because it's really just, I mean, I know it's, bio, it's, it's biological, but it's actually mechanical. This is a mechanical problem. I guess linking into that, we've had a couple of questions around um, your thoughts regarding surgical intervention versus exercise and, and um, the rehab uh, exercises that you do. So um, what are your thoughts around you know, snipping of ligaments, the resections of the the processes? Well, everything's on the table with this problem because it really isn't fair to the animal to ride them if they have a compromised spinal cord. Um, so I don't dismiss any of it, but I'm only really interested in things that work. So I would say that if your consulting vet believes the best course of action is to operate, then that's probably the best advice to go with. Because one way or the other, choosing not to operate or operate, you still have to do the rehabilitation. Mm. Because you, you may resolve the compression aspect, but you're not resolving the cause, yeah, yeah? which is you've the bottom has dropped out of the, the, the suspensory network that keeps the spine aligned. So you still have to do the rehab. So my personal feelings on this are, I would rather medicate and do the rehabilitation and then see, unless it's a very, very severe case where, and you know, I've seen some sort of nine or 10 processes compressed and they are banging away at each other and chipping away at each other. When it gets that bad, I think, yeah, you know, it's only fair, let the vet do their work. And, uh, and then after the vet has removed some of the really problematic stuff, then we can undertake a good rehabilitation. Great stuff, thank you. I think that answers Arabella's question. Um, you've, you've pretty much covered all of the aspects there. So she was asking about, snipping of ligaments, steroid injections, which you mentioned earlier as well, you need to get that initial relief um, and that we, that training. So it all works together, doesn't it? I think that's the... It does. I think you throw everything at it. It, it is an all or nothing situation. Hmm. I mean, yeah. I, I put myself in the place of the horses. Yeah. Um, and I think we should all do that in that um, we're in charge. It's fiduciary we have to alleviate their problem. And um, so, yeah, you know, and, and I, I, I commend most of the horse owners that, ha that faced this problem. They didn't think that this was gonna be a problem when they bought their horse and it's developed or they've discovered it shortly afterwards. 
it, it, it is a tricky situation to be in. And I would say just research it, throw everything at it. Because without it, the horse is not going to have a high quality of life. And thinking into that, Simon, you, you said um, you, you don't ride a horse that's got um, the spinal processes you know, touching and, and impinging on each other. Um, Lara's asked, is there any activity that is a hard no for a kissing spine horse? So I guess you're saying without rehab and treatment, then potentially riding is one of those things. I think so. I mean, we're talking about bone on bone contact. Mm. Um, I can't imagine what that feels like, thankfully. But if that's the case, any weight on, on, the, on the, that area is going to cause more discomfort. So, yeah, it's a no-brainer as far as I'm concerned. You get stuck in, you use the meds, give them the drugs, you know, it's the least you can do, and, um, and then get stuck in on a rehabilitation program. It's not hard. It can be done. And, you know, again, six months is not that long a time. I mean, when we're training horses that aren't compromised, a six-month period may show a 10 20% improvement in way of going, if you're lucky. Um, so six months out to do this, to then restart the schooling and training aspect, well, it's actually the most economical time scale if you try and work around it you find you'll top out somewhere the horse will start to uh, either degrade in performance or level out and you won't be able to get beyond a certain point yeah. now if you've got a very very light rider and it's a walk on a hack and the horse is happy to do it again if 40 percent of them are asymptomatic or at least not obviously suffering then why not but from my perspective, is th that's just not good enough. Mm. You know, if you're a horse owner and, you know, there's this issue and there is a solution and it's something that I think pretty much anyone can do if they follow a good program, um, I can't see why anyone wouldn't. Mm. And um, so let's, let's take that, um, that topic now and the program and look at the balance of ridden versus ground because I, I think that this leads in quite, nicely and we, we had a couple of comments um that's linking into what you're saying which is why do vets seem obsessed with getting you back on board after three months after surgery so i think agreeing with you know it's take the right amount of time and and they also say the rehab before and after or for life is the same whether surgery or, or no surgery so so actually commenting all about taking the right amount of time and the right the right process so if you give us perhaps a bit of an overview of, of um, again, so now we, we know the horse has kissing spines, uh, we know perhaps they're in some discomfort, you've perhaps done the, the um, medication route and now you're looking at uh, how do we start off, what exercises and how much ground versus ridden and then we'll ask, again, we'll bring in some questions. Okay, so, so we have a diagnosis, the horse is comfortable. Um, I, I just start with the lunch work. And my objective um, in, well, I, and this, this lasts as long as it lasts. Okay, so they're all different, but I start with the lunt work and my objective is to, I mean, if they're, if, if they're seriously compromised, I'll start in walk. But as soon as I can, I want to get up to a jog trot. Now, the reason for this is that uh, because the walk is four time and the, uh, the, the, uh, the sequence of the limbs is disconnected, there isn't really a connection of the energy in the walk. So the walk is just to get the horse used to it if they've really had a bad time and I want to get them into the, the program slowly. Half of it's psychological too, because of course they've been suffering. You know, and I think it's um, from an empathy perspective. If the horse has had a bad few years, the last thing you want to do is sort of go out and say, okay, now we're rehabbing you go for it, <laughs> you know, um, mm -hmm. we, we sort of set them up slowly with the walk. But again, as soon as I can, I want to get them into a jog trot. Because the trot is um, diagonal pairs, it sort of connects and invites the core into the party that the walk doesn't. 
And uh, so as soon as I can establish a jog trot and the horse is happily sort of going around and, and sustaining the trot on their own, then I'll start to bring the uh, a flexion in the neck with hopefully leading to a bend through the body and the neck eventually. Um, to bring the spine into this inner curvature, this shoulder in alignment, to invite the horse to stretch the nose down. Now, I don't use any gadgets because I feel that any compression on the system, any restriction on the system is adding to the problem. And they don't need it. Really, what happens is, is when you can get a nice rhythm going in the trot on the lunge and you can get this inside flexion that lines the spinal column up on a curve, the horse naturally stretches forward, down and out. Now, of course, if they're very tight on the top line, they can't stretch very far initially, but on a daily basis, this stretching forward, down and out into the curve, um, they get lower and lower and lower because they find it soothes them. They can feel it decompressing. They don't know it's there, so we have to show them because they haven't sit there. They're not watching the webinars. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> And then when, when they do stretch down, they feel the in, increase in, uh, in comfort and motility through the back. And then once they can stretch all the way to the sand uh, in the trot, I then introduce the canter on the lunge and static exercises in, or walk exercises under saddle. That's just the method that I use. It seems to take all the different cases and it has a solution for all of them. When I've tried to do it in different, a different order, some of them, which say have lumbar impingements, which affect the horse very differently, they can stretch down straight away if they have a lumbar impingement because it's behind the saddle. But what they can't do is they can't control pelvic tilt. So they're very compromised behind and they can't use their back end properly. So of course that will take longer because the musculature is shorter and stronger at that point. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the trot work, once they can trot with the nose in the sand, I then start the canter work. It's usually crazy for the first couple of days, um, but then the horse settles down very quickly into it and then gets into the same rhythm that they had in the trot and starts to stretch forward and down. And once you do have a horse that will stretch all the way to the sand, in canter, in perfect balance, like a, a, a ballet dancer around you, this horse is ready. This horse is ready to be ridden, ready to strengthen. So there are landmarks along the way, which are our, our sort of mini goals from the beginning to the end. I think I'll, I'll jump in there because I think Alex's, Alex's question. Um, so Alex's horse has, uh, two narrowed joints in the cervical vertebra, um, as well as rehabbing from, from kissing spines, which have been medicated, which affects what they can and can't do, um, as they can't have anything that strongly manipulates the neck. Um, they've been a spectator at one of your clinics and watched your exercises involving turn on the forehand, rein back, etc., which you were just discussing about you would build up to that. And so Alex's question is, how do you build up to these or what alternative exercises are similar for a horse who's not very established in lateral work? So this milestone you're looking for, uh, you know, how do you build up and make sure you're, you're ready for that? Well, of course, a horse that's been through this experience um, won't be able to do any of this. And so it's not so much a question of my horse can't do it, what else can I do? It's a question of breaking it down into its very, very simple principle and doing it, repeating it every day, just like a rehabilitation for a person, taking them to the upper limit of their comfort zone, making them feel comfortable about this, supported, you know, sort of emotionally as well, they're emotional beings. And, and you know, when they're, when they're suffering, you can tell, you can see it in their eyes. They're, they're, it, it, they're, there's a lot of negative emotion in there. They don't know what's going on and they feel insecure. So breaking it down to small pieces, for example, if your horse's turnabout the forehand isn't very good, 
You can do it in hand from the ground, give, give them the idea. Just use your, your hand or the end, at the end of a, a, a short whip where your leg will be in the future and train them to move away from that sort of prod from the, the handle of your stick. And then of course, when, you, when the horse is ready for you to get on, you just teach them how to do turn about the forehand from that principle. Of course, it'll be terrible in the beginning. All these exercises will be done awfully in the beginning. But the reason we're doing them is so as they learn them, they regain their core strength, their core flexibility, while not being in pain, which is what we're after. Yeah. So, so the horse not doing it well or not doing it at all is 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 part of the course it's normal and the reason you're doing it is so they start to use those parts of their body and build muscle where there isn't any so you you talked there about breaking it down and um, taking it slow and building those foundations and you, you mentioned about doing things every day and I think that links into a question from debbie who said how often should um, should you be doing the yoga se sessions with a kissing spine horse? If you don't have time to do them every day, will it hinder your progress? Um, so perhaps start with that one, actually. Yeah, enormously. It's about time. Mm. It really is. Uh, um, because of the challenge and the nature of the challenge, it's about grinding it out. It's training it i mean it's rehabilitation training but it's exactly the same as any other form of training it's about the hours that are put in i mean i tend to start horses off with one session a day and as soon as i feel they're ready i want to work up to two sessions a day maybe smaller sessions but i'd like giving them a session and then allowing them to recover turning them out in the field so they can walk around relax and then having another session this is how you make the fastest progress. And I find that two sessions a day speeds things up by a factor of three. Because how long, you're... How long, sorry, Simon, how long would you do those sessions for roughly? Um, I'd build it up. So let's say on the lunge, 10 minutes on each rein to begin with, softly. And building up to 15 and then 20 minutes on each rein in each session. And then if I was going to introduce a second session, I'd probably drop those down by about five minutes. But what, what is really important in the sessions is that after the horse is used to the exercise and they're getting into the lunch work, we have to have a little bit of a breakthrough every day. That doesn't mean you stay out for two hours. It means that we accept that the horse is going to be hollow, stiff, pitching the head to the outside, swinging the quarters in, trying to turn in on you because they say, I don't want to go around on this circle because I think it's going to hurt. Um, nevertheless, you have to make a little bit of headway every day at the top of their comfort zone. If you don't, they don't improve. So uh, the 10, 15 minute zone is, is where we we are aiming for because after about 10 minutes on one rein they tend to start to sort of maybe get a little bit tired where they're holding and that encourages them to sort of let go and move and this is the discovery they have to make and and, and it, it, it actually leads to an extremely important aspect of i think just training horses in general but um to rehabilitation is they have to adjust their posture themselves they have to relearn how to carry themselves there's only so much intervention we can have we can't explain it we can't show them so what we can all we can do is help them and that means okay covering the the, the physical aspect uh, from a treatment point of view so uh, it's it's as acceptable as possible for the horse to go through this 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 process but um also to make sure that they make a self-realization every day so again by dropping the head they will feel 
an alleviation of the compression in the back and less pain. Once they feel that, they will the next day, a minute earlier or two minutes earlier than yesterday, find that position because they know it's there now. So as you make headway with all of these aspects that we're working with, the horse is learning how to bend, how to stretch, how to decompress, how to get around the circle and experience less discomfort. And that's really where it is because ultimately you need a horse that self-balances, a horse that makes adjustments within their own body because you've asked them to do it. So they need to know how to do it themselves. And if they've gone through a period of having a compromised physiology, uh, it's not us that needs to learn anything. They need to learn how to work differently, but work more efficiently, to work better. Um, so, um, Alex, I think linking in with what you've just been saying about times on the lunch and so on, Alex has just asked an additional question. So, so it's, inter it's interesting, your timings on the lunch are interesting because um, like many people, she, uh, Alex has been taught to change rein frequently on the lunge, which certainly is what I was taught. I, I remember when I first learned to lunge. So just to, I guess, to reiterate, um, she's saying that uh, it's a better option during rehab to stick with the same rein until you get some progression and then you change rein and, and do the same on the other rein. Well, you have to make a judgment call whether or not you're pushing the limit. Hmm. I mean, I, I, I think after 10 minutes, they all do start to give an experiment with a different posture yeah. to, to try and get this circle done. Because initially, when they're on, say that they're on their, their stiffer side, which is sort of nine times out of 10, it's the left. Um, they want to, as we said earlier, bring the quarters in, put the head to the outside, hollow the back more, scoot sideways with the limbs, fall in. On the, on the better end, they tend to fall out. On the bad end, they fall in because they can't bend. Um, so I do feel that after about 10 minutes, you get something. Mm. Now, you won't get a lot, and you're only really looking for a 5% improvement per day, maximum. But obviously, that, that's exponential. As the weeks go by, they get better and better. But... Um, I think 10 to 15 minutes on one rein is ideal because what it does is it gives the horse time once they become accustomed to just going round and round in the same circle, boring as it may be for us, it isn't boring for them because it's hard. Um, so as they become accustomed to the circle, because of its regularity, if you're standing still and you make sure that your horse has a good circle to move around, they can use this regularity. They find stability in the fact that they know what's coming next, as opposed to being ridden, where you're saying, go stop, left, right, canter trot. They never know what's coming next. So they can't really experiment with postural alteration, where, the, again, the, the uniformity of the circle allows them to get into it and, and learn where the, 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 the exercise isn't changing. Mm. Um, and I think this is why it takes 10 to 15 minutes for them to say, okay, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be asked to stop and go and stop and go and turn. So I can, I, I can accept that I'm on this circle and, um, play with my posture until it feels better. And really that's all we can do for them. Are there any of the videos that would be useful just to show as, as an example, Simon? We Very good idea. Well. Yeah, now, so I've got a horse still in the moment, lovely horse called Freddie. Um, we've got a video number three. Have you got that queued up? Yeah, just bear with me. I'll just quickly share that. So, this is Freddie. That's Freddie. Okay, so that, this is this morning. Oh, amazing. Hot off the press. Oh, He's quite a character, is Freddie. Okay, so this is the beginning. I wanted you all to see this as the horse comes out, all right? So he's been with us a little while. So if we don't alter his uh, lateral flexion, this is how he will go. And he will go like this forever. He's, a, he, he, he's had uh, the operation, the leg snip. So what I'm starting to do here is I'm starting to put 
a little bit of traction on the head to bring him into a shoulder in sort of angle. You can probably see it as he's coming towards you and going away. And as I create this inside flexion, he will at some point feel the alignment in his back and start to stretch forward, down and out. There he goes, he's starting to do it. And so as he stretches forward and down, he can experiment with letting go on the right-hand side of his back where he's tight. And the movement will just allow, massage that muscle and encourage it to lengthen and stop gripping. And of course, as he lowers his head into the bend, he will feel his back lengthen and the processes separate. I mean, we can't tell what they're feeling. All we can see is the physical resistance. But, but then again, the physical resistance and the horse's attitude to what we're asking them to do will show us whether it's an acceptable level of, of uh, discomfort or we've gone too far. So you have to be very, very careful to uh, only ask them what you think that they, they can do in that session. So as Freddie gets into the circle and starts to relax into the left bend, he automatically starts stretching the nose towards the ground. Now after, this is the first two minutes, I think, after about 12, 30 minutes, Freddie has his nose all the way in the sand. And then at that point, we start the canter work, which is going very, very well. But it does take him 10 minutes to get there, which is normal. Now, after another few weeks, he'll come out and his nose will be in the sand right from the start. That's when we know we've decompressed the top line. And uh, by the way his canter work is going, the canter will, will be the same. And then we'll, we'll be getting on him and doing the, uh, the, the core strengthening exercises from the saddle. Like Nicky, he'll turn about the forehand, rein back and so forth. Is it worth showing um, one of the other videos maybe um, Wallace doing the same exercise to show yeah. you what happened. Yeah, we, we can do that. That'd be great. Yeah. So here's Wallace. And just while you're doing that, Julie's um, asked about um, the horse setting their own speed and not being rushed or, or driven. And she says she's, she's heard you at a, on a previous webinar talking about gradually increasing impulsion when you're on uh, the lunge and doing the core release. Um, what would you be looking for when increasing impulsion? How would you ask for it when you are? Okay, they're two separate things. So um, obviously um, we have horses I find tend to be fire or ice. Okay, so they're either hot or cold. If they're cold, you know, you've got to get sort of towards the rear and motivate them because they don't really want to go forwards, particularly if they're in a bit of pain. But a horse, for example, like Freddie, um, he really didn't want to go any, uh, sorry, he's uh, the opposite. He's a fire horse and uh, he runs away from problems. Okay, so he's going too fast. <laughs> and so you really want, I don't know, is this going at the right speed on your screens? Because it's sort of stuttering on mine. But this is the ideal kind of trot for the stretching yeah. work. It's, it's low impulsion. Yeah, sticking a little bit, but what we can do is when we send out the link to the um, webinar, I, I think it's probably your, okay, your end, Heidi, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's just a high in resolution slow motion, one. though, so it is a little bit, because it's in slow motion, it's a little bit. It doesn't help, does it? Yeah. It um, so uh, so it's, it's basically, it's not rushed. This is what we're looking for with for the stretching work. It's not rushed, but... Once the horse is stretched all the way down, then we can then, and because the, the reason we're using a very small circle is so we can control the bend. Because without the bend, you can't align the spine and they simply just don't stretch. So by making this shoulder in on the small circle and teaching them to do this in principle, after that, we can then make the circle bigger. So the small circle is only temporary. Temporary so we can affect their lateral posture. Now, the question, it's a good question. At, once the horse is stretched and they can canter and trot on say a seven or eight meter circle, then we make the circle bigger and teach them to do it in say a medium trot. 
on a 12, 15, or even larger. As long as the horse is now straight and can stay straight on their own, then, we, then the circle can be big and we can start adding impulsion. Now, I find this is very important for horses that are, have a competitive destiny. They have to have confidence going forward. Um, so yeah, as soon as they can stretch and they're loose and released and long and stretching all the way down to the ground, um, I get them out into a bigger circle and I work them in medium because I want to develop the musculature that propels the horse. And it's the same in canter. Once they can stretch down in the trot in medium on a 50 meter circle, I'll start doing the canter pretty much at the same time. It won't be as pretty as the trot, but once they get into it, they can canter medium with their nose stretched out and in the sand. And it's impressive. Because you're using an inside flexion, the skull comes to the inside of the forefoot. So they can articulate and stay straight, just the head and neck aren't part of their balancing mechanism anymore. And this is very important because of course, once the spine is released, the head really isn't a factor in how the main torso, how the trunk is operating. Because when it's operating correctly, the horse can canter with its nose in the sand or in a dressage outline and the pace doesn't change because the pace is the spinal column and where the limbs are attached to the spinal column, the head is really just a counterweight. So it doesn't matter whether it's down or it's up if the rest of it's working properly. So yes, forward work, but not too soon. Great. When they look like elastic, chewing gum, and they're soft, that's the time. Start teaching them to go forwards on a bigger circle. Brilliant, thank you, Simon. And you've talked about canter there. So we've got a, a few questions linking into the canter some came before and some have just come um, whilst you're talking just then um so uh, debbie's asked do kissing spine horses find it more painful to canter so i think you're suggesting it's more uncomfortable to start with and um, she says I've, I've owned my horse for four years before his design he was diagnosed with kissing spine he never showed any signs of having a sore back however his natural way of going was to brace his neck in the canter and he was always tight in the muscles under his neck uh, we've doing rehab since April. Um, when should you start incorporating the canter when you go through the rehab process? So I think you've you've talked about when to start incorporating it, but do most most horses find it more painful to canter if they've got kissing spine? Do you know, I think they do. I think they can trot along and compensate and just make the back rigid in the mm. trot quite easily. Uh, but the canter really shows up. Yeah, You know, uh, you can't get one canter lead or they become disunited and, and swap behind or don't want to go into canter at all. Or uh, uh, as you just mentioned, the head comes up in the air as a sort of reaction to what's yeah. going on. But that's why canter is so important to develop on the lunge. Yeah. And, and a couple, yeah, a, a couple yeah. of other questions linked to that, I guess. Um, an observation in um, class is interesting. You say the canter is messy as they develop. Uh, her horse kicks out so wildly to the side he nearly catches the lunge line with his inside hind, which she says is impressive for a kissing spine horse. Um, so she said she asks, should she sh persevere? Well, is 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 your horse uh, does your horse trot with the nose in the sand to the inside of the forefoot all the way around the circle nonstop? Because when it goes down and the spine is released, it stays there. Claire says yes, he, he does. It does, yeah. That's the time to, to work on the canter. I mean, what I do is I just do like, say, four or five circles in canter to start with. And they'll often go back to their old habits. And even though the trot works good, the head will be to the outside, they'll be falling in, quarters will come in. Um, but if you do a, a sort of four or five circles on the day one and then six the next day and then eight the day after, they'll find their balance. They always do. And any top tips for getting into the canter? So any um, Claire asks, is there any preparation I can do in trot when lunging to help the canter transition? Mm. Good question. Well, if you've got a fire horse and it's a hot horse, you probably haven't got trouble with that. But if you've got, if you've got a, a, an ice horse that doesn't want to go, 
um, then you just have to go old school and uh, position yourself towards the rear of the horse, not behind it and not within range of, 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 of a kicking distance, but get behind and use the tail of the whip and the voice and make your circle bigger and really get after them. I mean, I don't advocate hitting the horse with the whip. There's never really any excuse for that. But the lunge whip has a tail on it. And I find that just sort of waving the tail so it just gently touches the horse's back end. That repeat repeatedly, with a lot of encouragement, you'll get canter eventually. Hmm. And Simon, we've had a couple of questions asking, one from Jordan and um, touching back on one from, from Debbie and one from Lara about the balance. So let's assume now, you know, they, they're getting into this rehab. Um, what about the balance of on the ground versus ridden? So is it mixing it up? Is it ride three times a week, lunge twice? Um, what's the perfect balance uh, of ground versus on board is the general sentiment from those three? Well, um, if you're working twice a day and you've just and you've started the canter work and it's starting to become coherent, that's the time to very cautiously saddle up, lunge in the tack, and then maybe choose your day um, where after the horse has done a good couple of sessions and then get on as if you were backing a youngster. Uh, and then once you've achieved that and you can get on your horse and they're not upset about it anymore because you've done it very progressively and gradually, then I tend to go for the lunch session in the morning and the ridden core work in the afternoon. And if you so were only that. able to do one thing each day or if, you know, maybe only able to ride maybe five or do something five times a week, what, what do you think the balance should be then? Well, I think probably dominance on the lunch work because obviously anything with the rider's weight in place does risk a reversal. So it's very important to make sure that that is retained above the ridden work. And because if, if the ridden work is going to degrade the lunch work, then you've worked for nothing. You're sending the horse backwards. And actually that's a very important point. Any horse that's had a compromised back will regress quicker than another horse. If they've had a back problem in the past and you start using a bad saddle, within weeks, they will go backwards. So you have to be more careful from that point forward. So that's just a very important point. So I, I think I probably would, um, if I could only exercise the horse once a day, have a six day out of seven program and maybe lunge four times and ride twice. And you're really seeing how it goes. If the horse is accepting the ridden work well and it's not affecting the lunge work, the lunge work is still progressing, then you can have longer ridden sessions without detriment to the, 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 um, the release that you've now acquired on the lunge. And assuming you've progressed and progressed and progressed with the ridden, what are the indicators, um, Debbie's asking, when, it's, when you're ready to start regular dressage training again? Mm -hmm. um, well, the horse has to learn to give you forward, down and out, nose into the sand with you on board. When you've achieved that, you at least know that your presence on the horse's back isn't a detriment. So from that point, I think you gradually increase the intensity, duration, and uh, let's say impulsion level of the ridden work um, until the horse has a completely weightless head and neck. Now you'll be developing this on the lunge, this will happen on, and you'll feel it on the lunge because your horse will probably be pulling like crazy on the lunge in the beginning. And then as they become more relaxed and they bend through the back and they become more coordinated, the head and neck will get light. So you'll have nothing really but a contact on the end of your lunge line. This is your indicator of what the horse will be like. And as, again, as long as they're not going backwards when you get on over say a month period, then you can start going from a long and low weightless head and bring the horse up and then down and then up and then down. So you introduce the sort of classical dressage outline, if you like, for very short periods 
when the horse feels good and then stretch them back out again. And this prevents the, the back, which again, it, it, it remembers what it went through. So it has a tendency to lock up. So you have to just feel your way into normal work but with in short bursts to begin with. And then you'll see, because if your horse gets tense and heavy in the hand or gets any of the symptoms back, you went a little bit too far, which isn't a problem. You just dial it back, go back to a simpler exercise, reestablish it, and then just take a little bit more time. Brilliant. Thank you, Simon. Um, we've got a, quite a few questions came in advance and also um, currently on the Q and A's asking about other problems that the horses might have um, alongside um, kissing spine. So for instance, um, Ina has a horse who's uh, got kissing, ki sorry, kissing spine, um, but partway through the rehab program also um, was identified as having um, PSD, so suspensory problems. Um, so this, the rehab from suspensory problems says that you should be going in straight lines and mm. obviously the rehab for the kissing spine saying you should be going um in uh, uh doing doing your lunge work and working in a in, a, in circles so um, mm -hmm. she's, she's asking for some ideas yeah mm. that that is that there is a conflict there but but from my perspective and, and i work with a lot of horses that do have suspensory issues i've never had a problem as long as the impulsion level is low on the lunge and the surface is good. You know, if the surface has a lot of give, really, if the leg has been signed off by the vet as returning to work, it's, I've never experienced a problem. And um, someone has also asked, uh, some horses with other concurrent issues can't be lunged, so do you long rein instead? So would you get some of the results you're after from long reining? Um, probably not, because if uh, when when the spine isn't working correctly, it tends to not only hollow and lock, but also it kinks itself laterally. Um, I think we have an image somewhere with two horses on astroturf from our previous. Bear with me. I'll have a little look for that. I don't, there's another one, there's, uh, sorry, there's another one, not the green one. It's one with the horse from above and you can see his spine and some and it, arrows. Yeah. Oh, the two, have they got a picture of two horses, yeah? That's no, one. not that one, it's another one. One horse uh, from above and you can see the spinal column. Sorry, I'm just looking for that. You keep chatting and I will find that yeah. picture. And just while Heidi's looking, for for that one there's a question about working with physios during the horse's rehab and recovery what would you recommend i again i think throw everything at it if you've got a physio that you trust and a chiropractor yes yeah everything and you know you you, you the farrier needs to be on it the saddler needs to be in on it yeah because Which it's the little things that make a difference yeah yeah that's great yeah so once you do get a misalignment, you get several. Um, many horses that I mentioned earlier will solve a major one. Um, say this horse is compromised where it's, uh, if you can see the angle of the spine oh, in the I lumbar apologize. area. Sorry, I just oh, sorry. lost the slide again, sorry, there we go. Yeah, so this, this horse, um, the pelvis, is twisted anti-clockwise. There is a flexion in the lumbar area to the left, and also a rigidity in the thorax and the cervical vertebrae. So it's a combination of issues. So one would have to um, realign the spine and deal with each section individually. And it is about this to, to a certain extent because if each section moves differently. The neck uh, moves in three dimensions. The thorax can only flex laterally. Um, the lumbar area can round and twist, but it can't flex laterally. 
So we ha the, the work that we're doing is really compartmentalizing each section to bring it back into line. Because most of them have this compensatory uh, combination of misalignments throughout the back, this is, what, this is why it takes so much time. And this is why we have to use the, uh, the shoulder in placement on the lunge. So we literally traction the spine back to where it should be. Thank you. Um, other, other problems and can call conditioning help? Caroline uh, talks about her nine-year-old warm blood who's been diagnosed with mild to moderate joint degeneration in both stifles. Would the core strengthening exercise help his rehab and could you recommend any others, please? She's currently walking in hand 20 minutes, a little trot and using raised pulse. Mm. Are, you on, are you in touch with her? Um, yeah. um, we, we can be. Oh, no, I just wondered if she's there, if, if oh, it's a live she question. Is, ah, no, it was in, let's have a look, is she on the participants? She is... Yeah, she's she's there. Yeah, she's on. Could you ask her what treatments she's had done on the stifles? Yeah, um, Caroline, if you don't mind bobbing in chat, that would be the quickest for you. What um, treatments? Yeah. While you do, could you just repeat to me the question? Yeah, so nine-year-old warm blood diagnosed with mild to moderate joint degeneration in both stifles. Would the core strengthening exercise help his rehab and could you recommend any others? If the stifle is the only joint that's compromised, it's more than likely that the problem is the pelvic angle. Because of course, if the back isn't performing properly, the, um, the, the, the big structures at the top tend to not move. So what happens is the horse has to create movement elsewhere and overextension of the stifle tends to be one of the ways they do it. So obviously when the horse is moving, the pelvis should be able to yaw, pitch and roll. And if the horse can roll the pelvis under, uh, you know, sort of underneath the body, that brings the lower limb of the hind leg under the center of gravity. If the horse has a back problem and the, the pelvis is tilted forwards, then the stifle, has to overextend each time to try and get underneath the central mass. So without seeing the horse and without seeing x-rays, obviously it's, I'm making an assumption, but I would say anything that rounds the horse's back and therefore enables the pelvis to rotate will possibly alleviate the strain that the stifle is under. So the answer would be yes. Yeah, she says steroid injections in both stifles. Okay. So. And um, has, has she had a back x-ray? We'll find out shortly. Yeah, we'll find out. <laughs> Live. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> Live surgery with Simon. <laughs> And if no. not, I would. No, <laughs> well, I would. Say, yeah. I, I, I would. Because, you, you know, you really need to see what's going on in there. Again, yeah. you have to always try and locate the origin. Yeah. If you don't solve the cause, you'll be injecting for the rest of the horse's life. And things like the stifle, you know, it's again, it's only designed to take a certain amount of stress at a very, very specific angle. And just like a car, you know, if those stresses exceed design, then the, you get inflammation and pain and it, it won't go away. And medicating, medicating, I think, is only really justifiable on two fronts. It's like if it's a, 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 a problem which is not going to go away, for example, you know, it's uh, degenerative because of age or a lot of work, then yes, you're helping the horse function correctly for longer. But I think if the horse is young and fit and got a life ahead of him, then medicating on a regular basis is probably not the best thing to do on the long term. Mm -hmm. I have to look a little bit deeper. Uh, medicating while the rehabilitation, of course, as we talked about earlier, is, is, is the, the least we can do. But 
very unlikely that the, uh, the, the horse's stifles give out. It's the same as with the hawks and fetlocks. They are designed to last a lifetime if they're moving correctly. So I'd, I'd have a look at the back. That would be, okay. yeah. and if it all checks out, it all checks out. Okay. Good stuff, thank you. Um, linking in with the other problems again. So um, Tracy's asking uh, if, a, if a horse does have secondary problems such as SI, hip, stifle, et cetera, um, are, the, is the, are the six meter circles okay? Um, obviously it's a small circle. And then also we've got somebody else saying, um, there are, Alice, sorry, um, are there some alternatives to a tight circle if your horse is recovering from a leg injury and can't be lunged? So would it work on a very large circle? Um, and then another comment as well from Claire saying, is it detrimental to their hips and leg joints to lunge um, for 40 minutes, particularly in the canter? So sort of, I guess, some of the relationship between the small circles and the other parts of their body. Some comments there. Well, again, the small circle is temporary. Hmm. And only really generally tends to, we only do that for about six weeks until the horse is released because you need that shoulder and angle in the spine for the horse to release hmm. any bigger than this. And you can't influence this inside flexion. So you can't align the spine for the horse so they can release. So they don't, they'll just triangulate the cordials will come to the inside. They'll twist and they'll stay like that which is why lunging on a 15, 20 meter circle, it in fact exacerbates the problem because if you have asymmetry, the horse is avoiding using, using a part of the back, every, every step they make strengthens them asymmetrically, which is the last thing in the world we want to do. So ha using a very low impulsion jog trot on a small circle, again, if the surface is good and you're not going fast, then it doesn't do them any harm at all. If the horse has got a leg injury, let it heal and get it signed off by the vet first. Also, when it comes to cantering on the lunge, you don't canter on a very small circle. You use the small circle to get the flexion as we just talked about. And then once the horse is stretched out, you start making the circle bigger, as big as you can without the horse starting to triangulate again, in which case you make it a little bit smaller so you can still control it. So it's all about teaching the horse to do this. And once they've learned, then you can make the, the circle bigger. And, and because they've learned to stretch out and flex in and round the back, they'll probably retain it because it feels better. But if they don't, then you just bring it in a little bit, teach them to do it again. Now, um, when it comes to the canter work, I wouldn't canter the horse on, on, on a circle less than 10 meters. And when, when they could, because they've already learned to stretch. So there's no need to have a six or seven meter circle. And then, of course, in that initial phase, a 10 meter circle you need because you still need to create that inside flexion. But again, once they've started to stretch forward, you can make it 11, 12, 13, 14. Very much have to judge this depending on how the horse feels on the day. And also, you don't want to do 20, meters, 20, 20 minutes of canter on each rein. You want to do the trot work first. And when they're relaxed and warm and supple and you can let them out onto a bigger circle and they stay soft and stay low and stay flexed and it's effortless, then you do the canter for again, you know, maybe a minute and then two minutes and then three minutes. But once they get the hang of it, you don't need to do it to death. You certainly don't need to do 20 minutes on each train. That, that would be total for the session. Right. Okay. But e even if the horse is working on the canter, I'll still do five minutes to 10 minutes in the trot before I start working the canter, because of course canter is much, much harder work, right. which is why it's so necessary. And, and the reason it's necessary is because in the canter, the horse has to activate all these body parts and thrust the inside hind under the central mass to take the weight. It doesn't have to do this in the trot. In the trot, it can, the horse can sort of shuffle with its diagonal pairs which, which is why it's ideal for a sort of low impact stretching where the canter is dynamic. You know, there's a lot of impulsion. There's a lot of suppleness needed for the horse to stay round and straight and stretched, which is why you have to work there very, very progressively. Brilliant. 
Thank you, Simon. We've got a, two, possibly three more questions we've got time for. So um, well, I think a uh, question from Grace, I think it would be quite quick to answer. So Grace says, I've got a young horse whose x-ray shows kissing spine, but he's showing no symptoms, is working well, developing muscle, etc., and isn't um, extremely uneven. Should um, Grace go back and start rehab or continue with the work? Rehab. Yeah. Easy answer. And, and I'm sure, Grace, you've worked this out on your own. If the horse, the horse will always be compromised by this. Because if the spine is misaligned to the extent that the processes are touching, then you will meet an upper limit of willingness and performance at some point in the future. So absolutely. A rehabilitation in advance of anything going wrong is the way to go. And actually that leads on to a very, very important point. If any of you out there have got young horses and you're starting them, do these exercises, do this rehabilitation. It'll take, it won't take anything like as long as it does when, once the horse has learned to defend themselves. But with young horses, yeah, you teach them to trot and canter on the lunge with their nose in the sand. They're going to be a dream to ride and they'll never have a back problem their entire life. And I think that links brilliantly into um, a question from Colette. How can you prevent kissing spine in a young horse's development? Mm, absolutely. And in fact, I think that I hope that as time progresses in years to come, we do this because of course the cause of, of kissing spine is the fact that the horse is not designed to carry a human being and run around. So it's a force where nature has not accommodated adequate strength. Um, so if we are going to do this with a horse and we know that this is a problem that can occur, it makes sense to strengthen the bit that we're gonna be sitting on more than standard so it's really really strong so when we get on it doesn't it doesn't affect the horse's posture and again it's easy um if we do it with a three-year-old and we do it in exactly the same way they pick it up really really quickly because there's nothing restricting it and once the horse learns in his their first experience of being trained to um to to release through the back and flex and flow that's that's how you want your horse to be from the start the horse is going to perform so much better as training goes the they're not going to experience any um impingements or pain or restrictions in the back during the training process and of course if we're trying to train an athlete and educate an athlete um we don't want these things coming standing in the way and well, maybe one last one do we think on the breeding which is yeah. um and and this is exactly the certainly question is exactly why we need to do a full q a with you um is a mare with kissing spines more likely to breed a foal with kissing spines and uh, a question about is there a way to test for genetic predisposition and also linking to something colette asked about is confirmation a hint at likelihood of getting kissing spines yeah, it's a good question. And there, there have been a lot of studies recently uh, about genetic predisposition. But I think in the study that I read, they only used 14 or 15 horses, which wasn't a really big study. And I think nine of them were thoroughbreds. So I think that skewed the results slightly. Um, the, the stat that I use a lot is Dr. Holmer's study um, in Germany. Um, she found that 95% of horses had at least one impingement. So I think it's inherent. I think it just happens. I think that they're, they're not strong enough to do it. So yeah, we do it with the young horses as a preventative measure and it's fantastic. It's the way forward. Um, genetic dis disposition. I think that horses just have a disposition towards it because of the, the dynamics. Um, when you look at a horse's spine, some of the processes are two or three millimeters apart, just standing there. So any dipping of the back, even slight, and they're going to touch, which is why it's so prolific. But um, I, I wouldn't let that stop me breeding a horse. 
I would just train it differently than its mother. Great, great point. Absolutely. Prehab, not rehab. Absolutely. Ooh, prehab, that's brilliant. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Simon, we've, we've, um, we've spent a long time talking to people, which has been brilliant. And um, hopefully we've, well, we've got through the vast majority of questions. There's a couple we haven't managed to answer, but uh, I, I think we've got through the majority. Um, I can just put, I'm going to put your contact details onto the, um, onto the screen in just a moment so that people can get a hold of you um, if they want to, to chat and talk to you about um, rehab uh, for their, their own horses. Um, but just before we look at that one, just to, uh, I've got to, I think it's on here, isn't it? Oh, it's not actually got the title, but the 24th of March, um, we've got Hayley Marty, who is a, vet, a veterinary physio, talking about prehab rather than rehab um, in terms of other exercises that you can do with your horse to keep them in great condition. Um, and then there's a few more of our webinars coming up there, 17th of March, so next week, Donna Case, talking about spring feeding. We've got Justine Harrison, behaviourist, coming in talking about understanding fear in horses. And then we've got Anne Bondi on the 21st of April talking about all of the different types of saddle choice and fit um, that, that we, uh, we can choose from. So those are things coming up and I'll just pop this one. So I'm not doing a slideshow, uh, a proper slideshow because it, it decided it would go all over the place. So <laughs> just to put that final slide up there, um, Simon, these are your contact details, aren't they? Yes, thank you. So where people can get hold of you. And Lucy asked earlier on, where can she find out more about the exercises and so on? Um, and you, you talked about the book at the beginning. So your book called Conditioning for Horses has got really straightforward, easy way of understanding the different exercises. Um, and I understand you're planning to make some videos as well, is that right? Yes, we're underway at the moment filming. Um, it, this will be a step-by-step -step guide on how to take your horse from the first stages of lunging to ridden away and competing a horse through the rehab, rehab uh, the, re the kissing spine rehabilitation process. Uh, because it's not easy to get it from a, any other source. You have to see it done. I think yeah. we have to, you know, when, when, when people see it, it done, they get it and they can go out and do it, which is so important because obviously it's very specific. The angles have to be absolutely right. So, yeah, that's the goal. So um, watch this space. Hopefully we can do another webinar when those are out and um, yeah. talk about it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And we'll, we'll let the tribe know. Yeah, right. there are lots of thank yous from people and Lara says she's looking forward to her ridden session with you on the 30th of March. Does he want to give a discount code for the book? Well, if you come to Horse Fest, which is our festival, Simon will be there and he might sign a copy of the book for you. So check out on our website. That's the 9th and 10th of, of July up in Cheshire. So uh, we'll get a signature's worth more than a discount, I, I think. <laughs> I think it devalues the book. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh, brilliant, brilliant. Um, so do get in touch with Simon if you want. There's a question about live sessions for private groups. Do contact Simon and find out more. This is, he's amazing. We've both um, had sessions with him as well. So really fantastic. Again, I've learned loads. Claire says she's done two courses with you. She's learned even more tonight. Um, and thank you everybody for your amazing questions and good luck with your horses. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good luck guys. Yeah, thanks very much everyone. Stay yeah. strong. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.